we are going to do this presentation on legacy and sort of the generation bridge side of it. Um, we look at this as what are we doing to pass on or make an impact on our next generation. And Ryan came to me um, about a year ago, I think it was uh, right around the time that we were doing our uh, caregiver and aging conference at Southern Connecticut. Um, and he mentioned that he's been talking in different senior centers and other places about this sort of meaning and purpose that we have when we have more time. Uh, I know that some people who have registered are big into volunteering or mentoring, and that's exactly what we're talking about. And, and Generation Bridge, just as a whole, is about trying to break down uh, generational stereotypes and allow people to connect at the individual level. Uh, and what we mean by that is like, you're not a boomer, you're not a, uh, a millennial, you're not this, it, you're Brian Sherwood, you're Ryan Ventura, you're somebody that's an individual and you know, judgment should be based on those individual characteristics. Now, the other side to that is we all have life challenges and sometimes that tracks with when we were born and other times it doesn't. I always use this, uh, this example. I'm a father who's 44 years old, but I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old and a five-month-old. So I have a lot in common with someone who is 25 and has the same things. So we weren't born in the same year, but we're dealing with a lot of the same issues. And that's what we really want to focus on at Generation Bridge is life stage issues. One of the things that is particularly important from my heart standpoint is um, I know that men's suicide tends to jump dramatically once we hit into retirement stage. Um, a lot of that can be based on our identity being something tied to what we're doing for our work and other types of things. And that's why it's so important to tap into sort of what is your meaning and purpose going to be outside of the work environment? How are you going to fill those eight hours or 12 hours that you were working every day? What are the things you're doing to connect with the community? And most importantly, how are you going to share what you've learned with those who are coming up. Why should we repeat the same issues over and over and over again? Um, my mom does look like she's on here. So, you know, the, I always look at it like this. Why did it take until I was 30 to finally understand what she was talking about on so many different things, right? So these are the types of things that we find really important when it comes to legacy. And Ryan presents this amazingly. I wish we could do it in person. It's very engaging and interactive. Um, but we're in the environment we're in right now. And, you know, rather than try and build Ryan up in terms of his background and all this other stuff, all I can say is he is a great speaker in person. We're working through this new medium. We're going we're gonna to see how it all goes. Um, but he's a wonderful person when it comes to speaking, but also he's just a guy with a great heart. Um, you know, he's a former pastor. He's done a lot of good things in his community. He's got a wonderful family. Uh, and he's doing great work with First Light Home Care, where they're going in and they're helping people um, to, to get a quality of life when maybe they can't do all the things that they can do for themselves. So without any more buildup, Ryan, I'm going to let you talk a little bit more about who First Light is, who you are, and then we'll get right into your presentation because this is not a sales presentation. This is just really about him sharing his wisdom and things that he's seen over his life. Okay, well, thanks, Brian, very much. I appreciate it. And hello to everybody who's joining us. Um, as he said, I'm Ryan. You can call me Ryan. Uh, I work with a company right now called First Light Home Care. Uh, we provide non-medical home care to people uh, who are living independently at home. Basically, what that means is we can bring um, aids or companions to help people who might have a, a couple of needs that are preventing them from living independently. So with a little bit of dependence, they get a much broader sense of independence. Uh, I'll touch on that a little bit more towards the end uh, and it'll make a little more sense as we all go. But as Brian said, this really, we're not gonna be talking about home care at all <laughs> during this whole thing. This is all about legacy. And to start off, uh, if you have not yet gotten a pen or pencil, you should, or even you're using your phone is totally fine as well. Good job, Brian. Um, let's, let's start off with this, okay? Uh, if I even just said, and we'll, we'll pull this one down here, oh, there we go. If we even said, what do you think of when I say the word legacy, what comes to mind? The word legacy has a lot of different meanings there. So, you know, take a second, just try and give a one sentence definition, or maybe it might even just be one word. When you hear the word, oh, he left a pretty good legacy. 
or she she left an incredible legacy. What does that mean? What's the first thing that kind of sparks inside of your brain? Um, as you're writing it down, and you don't have to kind of fill it out here, but I'll tell you some of the answers that popped up. Um, the first thing everyone always thinks of is money, okay? Um, the Ryan Ventura wing of the hospital was my legacy. Um, I don't have that much money. That's never going to happen, right? Um, the other thing, a legacy might be, would be um, something that is left behind, but again, physical. Um, maybe there was a monument made in their honor, um, just to kind of remind us of the legacy of the Battle of Bunker Hill, the, uh, the statue of that person in the college courtyard, whatever it might be. But a third option, and this is actually from uh, Webster's, if that means anything to you, but uh, the way that legacy is defined is an inheritance. Again, first thought is money. But it goes on like this, an amount of money or property left to somebody in a will, or it is a gift, a settlement, a birthright, or one other thing is an attitude of the person. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today is your, your name is your legacy. In other words, what is it that you left behind? What part of you did you leave behind in another person? We've all heard this expression, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, or she has her mother's eyes. You, you leave a little bit of yourself and everybody, that's natural DNA. But the idea of legacy is more than just a physical DNA or a financial DNA. We're going to be talking about a character. DNA. So what do I mean by that? Um, I got a little example here and you're going to have to bear with me as I'm reading off of Zoom, but I do this during my live presentation anyways because it's so big, but it's also so important. There was a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Edwards. Okay, He lived in the 1700s and there was a study done. This guy was uh, a 1700s uh, old New England preacher. He and his wife, he was a farmer and a pastor, uh, not a lot of money back then as a pastor. You know, he just kind of did it as a, as a part-time thing. Um, but he and his wife had 11 children, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> so here's the deal. What Jonathan Edwards did, and it was recorded, is that he each night would spend an hour with his family speaking life into each of his children. Joe, I see this in you. Sally, I see that in you. Mary, I can, you know, I love this. I appreciate, I'm grateful for. And he would do that every single night. So time went by. This was the 1700s. In the 1900s, let's see here if I get this right. In the 1900s, a gentleman decided to find out whatever happened to Jonathan Edwards, and more importantly, his descendants. He was able to trace back from those two couple, you know, Jonathan and his wife, and those 11 children, 1,500 descendants. And this was in the year 1900, so this is 100 years ago. Um, but here's what he found out, that of that 1500, the legacy goes on that of those children, catch this, 100 of them were lawyers or a dean of a law school, 80 were holders of public office, 66 were doctors or a dean of a medical school, 65 were professors, 30 were judges, 13 were college presidents. Three were mayors of large cities. Another three were governors of the United States. One, I'm sorry, three were in the United States Senate. One was the controller of the United States Treasury. And one was vice president of the United States. Pretty incredible. Now, I did more research on this story. And there was another guy who lived about the same time. And his name was Max Jukes. Max Jukes 
his legacy came to people's attention when 42 different men in the New York state prison system were traced back to him being a relative. 42. He was a known criminal, Max Jukes. He lived in New York about the same time Jonathan Edwards lived in New England. And his family of descendants, for a guy who didn't really give a rip about society, included seven murderers, 60 thieves, 190 prostitutes, 150 other convicted criminals, 310 paupers, and 440 who were physically wrecked by addiction to substance abuse. Of his 1,200 descendants, 300 died prematurely. You get two different stories of legacy that took place at the exact same time. Neither of these men had money. Neither of these men had power from the world's society. But what they both had was influence. Influence over a sphere of their immediate circle. And one of them had the foresight to look ahead into the future of what type of legacy he wanted to leave and the other one thought only of himself. And the ripple effect from generation to generation over the course of those years kind of speaks for itself. This is legacy. You know, another gentleman gave to me the challenge to say if you had to write your tombstone right now and you could only use six words, six words, it could be a complete sentence or it could be six different words, what would your tombstone be? Your brain is spinning a little bit right now, right? Now you're, maybe you're counting with your thumbs and what are my six words going to be? But if you only had six words, father, husband, son, likes a lot of candy, I don't know, you know, something like that, you know, what, what would it be? It's not to be morbid, but science has proven that you currently have a 100% chance of dying one day. It's a fact. And when you think about it from that, you kind of think, okay, what do I want my life to mean? There was one guy uh, who maybe you heard of, uh, his name was Merv Griffin. He was on TV a lot. Uh, I was actually able to track down Merv's uh, tombstone. I'm gonna show you a picture of it right here. But Merv's legacy said, I will not be right back. Which is clever and it's a chuckle, but it's, it kind of gives a little like testimony to who Merv was and what he was known for. What do you want to be known for? What is your legacy going to be? You know, there are a lot of good things about legacy, but when you kind of have this idea of legacy as a definition, put your name in front of that word legacy, Brian's legacy, Mary's legacy. And what's that definition going to be to follow it? Chew on that for a second. And as you do, I want to show you this picture. This idea of examples of legacy really comes down, and I love how this picture kind of conveys it, where you have older hands giving, we'll just call it a plant of potential to younger hands. Now, Brian just expressed how he had three younger kids. Um, I have three older kids, um, 11th grade all the way down to fourth grade. And I don't think the 11th grader versus Brian's preschooler will, will pretty much be on the same page. If this was me handing a plant to one of my children and saying, this is going to become a pumpkin, uh, uh, you know, whatever we want it to be, a squash, a cucumber, a tree, uh, uh, your future tree fort. They would look at it maybe for five seconds and say, mm, yeah, and drop it and go off and play with something else. Because it is, it, it, it's not comprehensible at this point. They don't see the potential. Now, there was one point when my daughter actually brought home from school something just like this, and it was in, a, in an egg carton. And like, look, I brought back a plant. And I said, what type of plant is it? I don't know. And they stuck it in the window. They never watered it. It withered, and it died within the week. 
But when it comes to this idea of legacy, we have to be willing to say, whoa, 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 whoa. This is going to be awesome. In other words, you have to speak the value to what that is going to be. You can't see it right now, but it's all there. It's all wrapped up into one thing. And we're going to give it sun. We're going to weed it. We're going to water it. We're going to invest in it. We're going to give it priority. We're not going to forget about it. We're going to tend to it. And soon this is going to bear fruit that will have value in the future. The future is something that is very um, unpredictable. I think if all of us were trying to figure out what was going to be happening at this time last year, you would have said, I don't believe it. There's no way that could ever possibly happen. But here we are living in these crazy days. But what I have noticed is that businesses, and we'll just take businesses, for example, businesses that are founded on strong character principles are weathering the storms. Businesses that were always out there just to get a quick buck, they don't last very long. Not when this type of pressure is on. The same type of thing can be said for our legacy, that we are really trying to invest a vision for the future to this next up and coming generation. So as good as that sounds, there are obstacles with leaving an, a legacy, right? Um, there are three, because I got those three little arrows here on the screen, there are three that I really want to print out, print out and point out to you. Um, the first one is that we live in a very present-minded society. What do I mean by that? I mean that if you turned on the news today, and maybe you already did, that the news today, the headlines, are not the news of yesterday. Yesterday's news has already come and gone, and it's done, right? We have no uh, appreciation for what happened yesterday. In fact, if I go and I get the paper today, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, this is all old news. I already know all this stuff. And it just came off the press a couple of hours ago. We are getting information at such a rapid rate that we can only really find ourselves time to live in the present. What's happening right now? If you posted something on social media now, within five minutes, it's six scrolls down at the bottom of the feed. Who cares? And if you don't go viral within the first 30 seconds, it's old news. And some of us who are listening to this talk right now don't even know what the word viral means because their terminology is changing all the time as well. But this concept of, of being present-minded, here's the hindrance, that there is very little sense of history and value of it. Maybe you've heard the expression that goes, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. That means that if you can't learn your lessons now, you're going to find yourself doing the same thing over and over again. And that doesn't just mean us as a society. It means us as a community. And it especially means you and me as individuals. I myself have stumbled hundreds of times over the same thing. We have bad habits, we have bad tendencies, we have things that we just don't like. Why do I keep doing that stuff? And if we don't take the time to analyze and remember and reconfigure, we're gonna keep doing it again. But as a society, we're very present-minded and we just say we have no time for that. And we forget our past. A recent study came out on Fox News that with the up and coming generation, too many people do not know anything about the Holocaust. In fact, the statistic that I saw last night was saying that 30% um, of the up and coming generation believe that the Holocaust was purely myth and made up propaganda. It's crazy. Why? They don't even know the stories. It's just whispers of a, I think I remember hearing something about that. But nobody is speaking to them. Nobody's reminding them. And look what's happening in our world today. 
Because those stories weren't remembered, we're seeing discrimination and hatred at incredibly high levels. We live in a present-minded society. The second one that we do is we live in a disposable society. I thought about, when I had better thoughts, about bringing in a, a shovel that I have. Um, I use it around the house. It's a very rusty, broken down shovel, but it still works. Got it at a yard sale for about a dollar. Well, one day my friend Kayla called me over and asked me to help him out around the yard. I said, sure, I brought it over, the shovel. And he looks at it and he's like, Ryan, what, what is that? <laughs> it's my shovel. And he said, why don't you go to the store and buy yourself a proper shovel? My response was, why? This, this one works. Totally fine. I, I'm sorry that the rust offends you, but it, it'll dig your hole that you just asked me to come over and dig for you. But his point was just like, you know, it just, just throw it away. Buy another one. Today, when, and I do mean when, not if, I get a hole in my shoe, it is more economical for me to throw these ones away than it does to take it to a cobbler. We throw stuff out all the time because when things lose their value, it gets disposed of. I, I also have another trinket. It's about this big and it is a piece of stone and it's a carving that I carved. And if you asked me how much I want for it, uh, I would say that it is invaluable because this was the stone that I was carving in an art shop on the very first day that I met my wife. The significance of that stone, which looks like a five-year-old could have done it, is priceless. Not because of the stone itself, but because of the meaning that is associated with the stone. But you know what, if somebody was coming around and just kind of like looking around here, they would have grabbed that thing and thrown it in the garbage right away. And I know from personal experience that if I went to your house and I looked around, maybe your kids have come in and said, Ma, what are you doing with all this crap around here? Throw it out, let's clean this place up. And your immediate reaction would be, don't you dare touch that. That's the thing that I got at that vacation when you were just in diapers or whatever it is, right? That little thing over there reminds me about the time. This little thing shows me about and so forth and so on. There was one lady that we worked with at First Light where her entire refrigerator, top to bottom, was covered in magnets from every travel that she had taken for 60 years. And the conversations, and now she kind of had dementia, but the conversations that she was able to recall where I said, what's the crab from? That's our trip from Maryland. The lighthouse is from Rhode Island. That little bear was from Yellowstone. This little thing, I mean, it, it was like page and verse. She had the whole thing laid out because all of those trinkets were burned in to associate with part of her history, where she took her kids, where her kids had been, the lessons that were learned. But if we live in such a disposable society where we're taking those lessons and we're taking those stories and just letting them go, we're losing a part of who we are. And then the last thing is this, we live in a very impatient society, right? Have it your way right away. Just do it right now. I mean, if I have to go, and especially nowadays, everything is drive-through focused, right? And if I see more than three cars, I'm like, ah, forget it. I'll just come back another time. Heaven forbid I have to wait five minutes in this line. We live in such an impatient society. It, it robs us of our history. It robs us of the value of investing in things. We want things to happen immediately. Waiting for our own computer to boot up can, can make us go crazy, right? Oh, I've been waiting for 30 seconds. This is insane. I need a new computer. Dispose of the old one, get a new one. 
How old's your computer? Three months old. I need a new one already. It's, it's just you, you lose that value. But, but building a legacy, and I want to read this quote to you because it's so good. Building a legacy is a slow process, and more importantly, the results of our effort may take a very long time to manifest themselves, and they may not even come to fruition until after we are gone. Let me say that one more time because this is very important for you to understand. The results of our efforts may take a very long time to manifest themselves and they may not even come to fruition until after we are gone. I don't know if any of you have ever or ever did have the opportunity to visit Notre Dame Cathedral or Notre Dame Cathedral. Brian did. Uh, the words that I have heard people describe it are magnificent, breathtaking, inspiring, awful. Not awful as in bad, but just struck you with awe and wonder. But the reality is, is that the Notre Dame Cathedral from the day they planted the first stone of the foundation, took 200 years to build. 200 years. Do you understand that kind of concept? That means that the general contractor went up to the bank and said, hey, listen, I got this great idea. We're going to build this great church. It's going to be wonderful. Everyone's going to come from all over the world. You'll be the biggest founder of the biggest thing ever invented. Bank says, this is great. We love it. Yes, we're invested. How long is this going to take us? And the GC says, about 200 years, start to finish, give or take a year. Upon which the bank is like, so wait a second, I'm never going to, I'm never going to see this. And the GC says, not only you, but neither will your children, your grandchildren, or your great-grandchildren even see it. But it's going to be worth it. And somebody who had the same vision as that general contractor, said, I believe in this. I will invest it, even though I will never see the results come to fruition. That is legacy. I think, you know, I'm sorry, Ryan, but I just, you know, <laughs> as you're talking through that and you, you go through it and you see also the, the craftsmanship, because it, it wasn't like you put it into a 3D printer and it, you know, it, it puts this stuff together. What you, what you also have is the culmination of artisans and apprentices and everything else working tirelessly, you know, for a lifetime on a project, you know, and, 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 but their, their work, you know, again, with the fire, you know, excluding, hopefully everything is still going to preserve. Okay. But, but their work lasts for that amount of time as well. You know, when we think about how long that's been there, something that someone's hands touched so long ago, maybe their story might even be lost at this point, but their legacy is there because it was done by hand. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And, and I think you're right. We are, we're in an Ikea world when it comes to furniture and that kind of stuff, right? It's like, oh, I can just go out and get a new, new dresser or something else. Whereas, you know, I would say even as, as, short a time period back, it's like 20 or 30 years, you were still relying heavily on what people were going to give you to outfit your home with furniture and other things like that. You know, now it becomes a point where we can just kind of buy, it breaks, get a new one in five years or 10 years when we want to change the look. Um, very different mindset. And I can't say that it's, you know, in some cases, it's, it, there's a good part of that, right? We get to have some things that we really like, but on the other side is, we don't value kind of the work that goes into kind of creating these things and we don't put the effort into creating them. So um, I, I just, I just wanted to come in and interject on that. I'm sorry if I broke your flow, but. No, that's great. Yeah, that's such I, a good example. And, um, and while we're kind of like pausing here, are there any other questions or anything that's popped up since then that I want to just kind of give um, space for? Um, so I'm looking on the, on the chats right now. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody wants to take a moment to, to kind of write that in, um, feel free to send us. If not, that's okay. We'll get going again as well. Um, I do want to say, you know, another analogy, um, to, 
and, and I'd love to kind of get your, your opinion on this because I know you're into movies and all that stuff too, but, um, but like Toy Story. Mm. You know, the, the Toy Story series of movies, you have, you know, four movies over almost 30 years now. You know, it's getting close to that, right? I think they, they, yeah. it was 30 this year. Um, but what you have is sort of the child grows up eventually transfers the, 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 the toys on to someone else and then so forth. And, you know, as we're talking, like you could, you could, it, what if I, what if I protected that, that toy and kept it in its wrapper? Oh, if I'd only known this was going to be so valuable. Um, but the other side to that is when you watch like the antique road show and those types of things, uh, it's really cool when you see this old used toy come up to the, to the antique road show and they explain the story behind it. And then it, what's also really cool is like, it's in good enough shape, but they say the patina has to be on it. You have to, you, you can't restore it. You got to keep the original wear and tear because it's a toy that was used. It was an yeah. object that was used and that's important. Um, you know, you're not looking to get something new. You're looking to get something that has, you know, been used over time by different people and so forth. And, uh, you know, I, I, I just wonder what are your kind of thoughts on sort of the, if I'd only known then versus the sort of, I'm using this thing over time or it's, you know, my grandfather's old toy and blah, blah, blah. I think uh, th this is, this is kind of my, my take on it. And again, it's, it's the idea of legacy, right? There's, there are things that people leave for legacies for financial purposes. And then there's things that people leave for character development purposes. Right? So for example, um, I used to love to play with GI Joes. Okay, that was that was my thing. We bought the GI Joes, we had them, and we would twist them and paint them and chuck them and and play war and games and all that other stuff with them. And a couple of years ago, I saw exactly what you were just talking about. Some adult now, when they were a kid, bought those GI Joes and never took them out of the box. And I think when I was purchasing them, they were four dollars for an action figure. And this one box was selling for uh, at least $2,000 mint condition, never opened. And the guy had like 20, right? So, you know, now he's going off to pay for his kid's college education because he deprived himself of that opportunity back then to actually play. Um, but I think something is lost when you're introducing to the young people, not the value of money, that's very important to teach, but the value from withholding, um, experiencing things for the sake of, well, one day you'll be able to appreciate this, right? Like you lost the, the element of play and imagination and dreaming and visualizing and experiencing for kind of caging somebody in to say, well, one day you'll thank me for this because I'm going to prevent you from experiencing what you should be experiencing at this age. That's lost. Um, now, if mom bought them a toy and also bought another one to save it, you know, instead of that, that's totally fine. That's a different thing. You know, like, surprise, I kept one for you, and then it's really the deal. But I think that what we're talking about now is, you know, my, and I'll give you one example that's really more practical. Um, my grandfather had a knife collection. He just collected pocket knives. He was a flea marketer, and that's what he did. And my brother and I loved it because we were boys and he has literally hundreds of pocket knives. So rather than just saying, don't touch, he went out and he bought two Swiss army knives for us. And he taught us how to use the knives, taught us what they were for, taught us how to handle it, taught us how to not cut ourselves so that now, long gone, but we still have the knife connection and we can handle it properly and we can appreciate why he took so much time to clean it and prepare it and preserve it for us. See the difference? Yeah. One would just be like, don't touch the knives and then I would have no interest in them. But because he kind of showed us the value of them, we appreciate them so much more. Well, that's excellent. I'm, that's uh, kind of my example. I think that's a great example. I, I, there's no other questions at this moment. So, you know, if you want to feel free to Keep going. I know we're we're at one thirty eight right now, okay. um, but uh, but I'll, I'll keep an eye out for any questions. And if you do have any questions, feel free to use that chat button um, down below, and uh, I will get to it. 
All right, so here's um, our next slide here. And we've got about 10 minutes left in our, in our talk, just to kind of give you that minder. But um, you mentioned, Brian, Antique Roadshow, okay? Mm. Um, love the show myself. And this is actually a story that, that kind of spurs and, and runs parallel to it. But this is, uh, these pictures are from a real life story um, that in the picture on the left came across um, a guy who was traveling down the road and he saw this house dilapidated, broken down, run down, broken everything, overgrown. Uh, he found out who owned said house, paid him cash, no questions asked for a piece of, piece of wood and rubble and stubble. The owner was saying, glad to get rid of it. It's been in my general, you know, family for years. I don't even want to deal with it. But what the owner couldn't see, that the buyer did see, was what was in that back corner inside the garage. You can almost kind of make out like a little white square. And that was the license plate to the cars that you can see down below in the second picture. They were covered in tarps and dust and disgusting. And the new owner cleaned up these cars and the other cars that were not seen. And he actually made, th those cars were worth more than the entire house that he paid for. I use that example because just like the Antique Roadshow, many of us have stuff in our house, right? Like, well, at least we like to think so, that we have stuff in our house that we're looking around and be like, is that valuable? Is that valuable? Is that worth a million dollars? You know, how much is that thing worth? You might not have a million dollar worth of crocheted knitting in your cupboard, but just as this guy had value inside his house, you have value inside of you. When it comes to legacy, the potential is already inside of you. And that's what you really have to understand when it comes to this idea of legacy is that you possess legacy. Just a matter of untapping it. So here are, here are four things. If you, again, if you wanna write these things down, here are four things that I want you to understand that you already have. Um, one, you possess wisdom, okay? I don't care how old you are, you're older than the next generation, right? you possess wisdom. A lot of times in our presentation, I would do with a show of hands to say, you know, how many of you here have ever fallen in love before and had your heart broken and everybody raises their hands, okay? You got wisdom because life goes on, right? Um, maybe some of you out there have lost a job, you felt crushed, but you know that life goes on. How many of you have ever lost somebody to to death or a tragic event in your life, show of hands, and life goes on. You see, your wisdom automatically qualifies you to be a speaker of truth to other people who haven't been there yet. The things, the hardships that you go through give you the credibility to speak into somebody else's life. You ever have somebody who who really has no idea what you're going through, come up to you to try and comfort you. And you're just like, whatever, you have no idea what I'm going through right now. But if somebody has gone through the same heartache that you are going through yourself, you're gonna give them the time of day to say, how did you get through this? Because unfortunately in this society, when people don't know what to do, they go to Google or they go to YouTube. And the problem with that is that it is a one way form of communication. There is no dialogue, there is no comforting, there is no counseling, there is no encouragement, there is no motivation. There's just a button to say, replay, if you need to kind of catch that again. Sometimes the situations apply, but most of the time they don't. And we're trying to fit a, a round peg in a square hole or a square peg in a round hole, whatever it is. It just it doesn't fit. The second thing is, is that you possess time. And if you're at the uh, 
end of your working career, or maybe you retired recently, or maybe if you retired a long time ago, you have time. And you might say, I'm still busy. Yeah, you're still busy, but remember how busy you used to be? Remember how busy Brian is right now with three kids under the age of six years old? <laughs> the fact that he's giving us an hour is a real gift of his time right now, but you have time and time is the one thing that money cannot buy. Even if you're a billionaire or a trillionaire, or if you're Jeff Bezos of Amazon or Bill Gates or anybody like that, they cannot buy time. And you have it. The question is, what are you doing with this very, very powerful form of currency? How are you using it? Are you using it and just frivolously throwing it away? Or are you investing in it to create a legacy? Third thing, you possess purpose. This is a very big thing. Brian brought this up at the beginning, that the, the level of suicide is skyrocketing. But it's funny. The level of suicide is skyrocketing on two polar extremes. The one is for people who are age 70 and older who feel like I've lost a sense of purpose. And on the other extreme, it's for those 20 and younger who say, I have never had a purpose and I don't even know what to look forward to. I'm just told that the world is going to end soon, so why bother? See, these two polar extremes and the idea of Generation Bridge says, one is not more important than the other, but we need each other equally. That the older needs the younger just as much as the younger needs the older. The older can speak purpose into the younger, and the younger can say and validate the purpose of the older. Unfortunately, in today's world, all we do is we just turn to our cell phones and say, what am I doing here? And we hope for a valid answer. No valid answer is going to come because it takes a person to know a person. It takes a person to know what my interests are. You know, for some of you who remember your old Bible stories, there was a guy named Moses with the Ten Commandments and leading his people out of Egypt and crossing the Red Sea. And what I find is so amazing is that Moses, according to biblical records, was 80 years old when that job began. Which means for many of you, that if you are 79 and younger, you're still in your training mode before your real purpose comes around. So I hope you're studying and I'm hoping you're preparing and getting ready for that. But I, I say it in jest, but there's a lot of serious truth to that is that your purpose never really quite ends until you stop breathing. You have purpose. And the last one is that you possess a seed. Going back to that first picture that I showed you of you know, one hand passing it on to the other one. A seed takes a very long time to grow, does it not? One day I got to go into a, a tour of the Newport mansions. And we walked into one mansion. And as soon as you walk in through the door, you come into their foyer, which is almost the exact same size of my entire house. And on the floor of that foyer was this beautiful laid out mosaic of an acorn. And the tour guide was saying, does anyone want to guess why this acorn is here? People guessed wrong. And the tour guide said that the family wanted everyone to know, including the owners of the home, that this magnificent home, this legacy of money started with the size of an acorn, the potential of an acorn, and it grew into a mighty oak tree that is one of the hardest woods and the most um, durable in the storm, that it could withstand many strong winds. But it was a symbol of remember, remember, remember the signs of both your past and your future. I thought it was a phenomenal visual image. 
So the last visual image is this one right here. Um, I don't know if you know who the guy on the right is. He's an old dude. I'll give you a hint. This was him just a couple of years prior. Um, it's our buddy Clint Eastwood. And somehow this gorgeous locks of hair with a giant gun became this old guy reaching for a hammer. And some There's two movies. Uh, they're both scenes from movies. This one right here is from the movie called Gran Torino. Um, and if you have not seen it, um, it's kind of like a, it's not a movie for the faint of heart. How about I put it that way? Okay, it's, it is rated R, um, so be, be forewarned. But the message behind the movie is that there's this old guy named Walt who's just a cranky old guy who's really lost his way. He's lost his purpose. He lost his friendships. He's lost his connections in life in general. And he's basically given up and he's just pretty much given himself up to die at some point. But before that day happens, he runs into this guy, a guy without any mentor in his life, lost, purposeless, alone, and terrified of every single day. And through a course of events, Walt and this young man become a mentor-mentee friendship. Walt teaches him how to be a man, how to live, how to talk, how to be, and how to look ahead to the future for himself. If you haven't seen it, I strongly encourage you to do so. But it's this idea of uh, what does it look like where Walt says, it's not about me anymore. This was about me, <laughs> saving my own hide and looking like the hero. This is something different where Walt invests and trains up a new generation of heroes. I've realized that, um, you know, Brian and I were joking about how exercising is just dreadful now. It's not fun. <laughs> we are no longer the prime young people that we would like to think that we are. We need to be investing in the next generation, as, as truth be told. So what does it look like to start leaving your legacy? Here's a couple of ideas, and then we're going to kind of open it up a little bit. Um, one, I would really encourage you to start a family tradition. Maybe you already have it. Maybe you did it a while ago and you haven't done it for a while. But whether it be a recipe or a meal or an event that we do on a regular basis, start or restart a family tradition. Like I can remember on a certain holiday, my grandmother would make a particular meal. When you walked in the house, that was the smell that was associated with the holiday. Maybe something like that. Maybe it's you make an heirloom for somebody. Another personal example is um, my kid's great-grandfather several years ago got diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And when it first started, um, his daughter took him to a hobby shop because he was a woodworker. And together they made coat racks for my children. And he personalized every single one with a little touch of himself. Now he lost his battle to Alzheimer's a couple of years ago. But do you really think that we'll ever throw those coat racks away? Absolutely not. What do they cost? 10 bucks each? But their value is what they're associated with. And that is an heirloom that will get passed on. On the other side of my family, my grandmother, um, she wore the most hideous carpet bag jacket all over the world in every season. It was like Joseph's Technicolor dream coat. It was all these fabrics thrown together in every which way. And I'm telling you, from a mile away, you could see grandma walking towards your house because she always had that coat on. It was ugly. Well, grandma passed and my mom, with her warped sense of humor, took the coat, cut it up and turned it into teddy bears. Mm -hmm. 
and she gave them to members of the family to remember her by. We will never get rid of those teddy bears. Not because we like the coat, but because of what the coat represents. So find an heirloom. Um, another one, if you have not done so, I would strongly suggest journaling. To record your stories and to record your memories and to record your feelings. You know, there are many movies that are made off of people's journals and recordings. And we treasure those movies like, oh, I wish I had done something like this. Start now. And even if you think back and record what it is that you remember, write that down because that is invaluable information because it expresses who you are. And then lastly, and I'll just kind of send in the, the, this, sometimes I'm, I'm met with the pushback to say, Ryan, I, I have nothing. I can't do anything. There's nothing special about me. Then my final bit of advice comes from this, and I'll, I'm gonna read this to you, but then help your friends be a better steward of the gifts that they have. I'll say that again, then help your friends be a better steward of the gifts that they have. In other words, we all need cheerleaders. We need somebody to come alongside of us to say, I believe in you. We need somebody to speak life into our own lives. For many of us, that is our spouse. For others, it is a good friend. And your legacy could be known as, I could not have gotten to the place where I, could, where I am now had it not been for my friend, your name in the blank. You know, many of us, uh, when you, if you take the time to read a book, We'll see right at the very beginning, it says, this book is dedicated to whoever it is. And you know what? The story has nothing to do with that person. But for the author, that story exists because of that person. And credit is due. There was this one award called the Unsung Hero Award. And it goes out to those whose song is never, never told, never sung to the audiences. But without that person, the thing that we appreciate would never be there to this day. So, let's skip a comment there. The last point is this. So what the heck does this have to do with First Light Home Care? Simply this. <laughs> we are all about helping people live out their legacy. A lot of times we get calls as people are aging, but they're not ready to give up. Sometimes we get calls from kids who say, my parents have given up and they need a cheerleader. Somebody from the outside to come in and speak life. Sometimes a cheerleader is that friend or companion who's going to drive them to an event that they loved going to. Sometimes it's a matter of giving them their dignity of getting them dressed up to the nines and going out to their favorite restaurant. Sometimes it's a matter of saying, I just need to get to the doctor's appointment to get this clearance so that I can go to my grandchild's birthday. Whatever it is, First Light Home Care delivers caring and compassionate aids and attendance to help people live a life of independence and continue to live out their legacy. So if you want to know more about that, the information is right there on your screen. But if you're not in that situation right now, then everything I've already said still applies to you. So uh, I'll just kind of say thank you right now for listening. Thank you for taking the time. And when it comes to leaving a legacy, stop thinking about the next 10 or 20 years and start thinking about what you want your legacy to be two to 300 years further out the road, just like Jonathan Edwards. So Brian, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, I, I thank you. Ryan, I mean, honestly, every time I, I know it's only been twice now, but uh, I could, I could literally do this every week for the rest of the year and be just, 
I don't know. I'm like, I'm like ready to go through a brick wall. You know, this is, it was like, what is my do purpose? It. What's my meaning? Let's you know, do I, it. I'm just going, but, um, uh, but I, I do want to encourage, if you have any questions, feel free to add, uh, ask them in the chat section. Um, but I want to thank you for your time. Um, I do want to kind of, I do have one question and you had mentioned, you know, the Gran Torino movie. Um, and, you know, I, I know that movie very well. I don't want to give it away if people haven't seen it because it is a really good movie, but it's a, you know, it's one of those things where you have a flawed hero who, um, in the end is a hero because of what he, what he finds out with this new, new relationship that he develops with a young kid that needs help. Um, do you have any ideas on how do you identify somebody who needs your wisdom or, you know, is there something that like you've seen or, you know, I know that we could maybe find boys and girls club or other, you, you can get involved in mentoring or, or volunteering that kind of stuff. And I know some of the people on the, the seminar today, that's what they do. But is there, are there signs that we should be looking out for? Let's say it is those people that are at the polar sides, you know, where they're at risk. How do we, how can we identify some of the things about them to help us know that maybe this is a, a chance for us to step in? I think, I think one of the things that have just been lost on this upcoming generation is, is the ability to have a simple conversation. Um, many teens today will choose texting over talking 10 out of 10 times for fear out of being rejected or not knowing what to say or being caught off guard, right? There's no control in a human conversation like you and I are having right now. So that being said, I would really encourage people who are, who are listening to this to, you are not going to find somebody who comes up to you and say, hey, you, I need help. Can you speak into my life? It's not going to happen. But I think what we need to be looking for is just the opportunity to converse. In other words, start by speaking life into somebody. I like your hair. That's a great shirt. Where'd you get that tattoo? What does that tattoo mean? You know, what type of, where'd you get that case on your phone? In other words, find a way to speak value into somebody. Maybe you see the kid at the grocery store bagging your groceries and be like, you're doing a great job bagging groceries. You know, like, thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing this. And the kid might be like, uh, you're welcome, right? Or they might just mumble something. But I guarantee you, they remember that stuff. Um, I found myself seeing a young guy, we were at the beach, and this kid is trying to do the, the wakeboarding, right? And he's just kind of going by me and he's riding around and I said to him, I said, you know, you're doing a really good job. And he said, oh, really? He said, you know, one day I want to compete. And I said, you're going to do great. Just keep practicing. And he said, wow, I can't believe you think that. Thank you so much. That totally just made my day. And I'm like, I just paid the guy a compliment. I had no idea what that would mean. But you need to look for opportunities to speak life into people, whether you know them or not, particularly your own relatives that you see, um, follow up with them, ask them how things are going and just continue to be an encourager to them. Um, don't, don't always say, you know what I think you should do, just kind of say, what's going on? And have you thought about what your options are? I'd love to hear those. In other words, open up that conversation. Uh, and I think I did just want to do, um, let's see, if, I don't know if you would have to stop sharing so that I there could. Goes. Yep. All right. Let's see. Back to you. All if right. I want you to share that thing, that story, right? Yeah. So, so I, I, I totally agree with you on the journaling side. I think one thing that we may not understand at this point, and, and I know some people are leaving because it's, you know, they've got to go at the two o'clock time frame. Um, but uh, I do want to keep this just, just to, to show this, this little bit. But the journaling side gives us a point of view and a perspective from us at this time period that we're living in. And I think what we're seeing in today's world is like all of a sudden what you're seeing is like people making huge judgments based on people from 200 years ago or 300 years ago and, and, and not really getting the perspective of what was it like to live during those time frames. And I think, you know, even though we can, we can recognize when some things may have been wrong or, or off during those time periods, um, if we have those sort of journal experiences, we can really see what 
what was that person's mindset like? And, and I think that's so important and so interesting to read, especially if it's someone that you're related to. And tying into that a little bit is I found these, um, you know, leading up to this, this presentation, I found these Civil War buttons that my grandmother um, had offered to us. So my grandmother did the thing where she opened up the house and she's like, I'm getting rid of everything, you know? You guys take what you want and, and, and anything else that's left, we're just gonna, we're gonna get rid of it. And of course, you know, that's when we're going through and we're kind of picking and choosing and we don't have all that same connectivity that she had with everything. But these were really interesting. And, and what was really cool too is that it, fortunately it did have information about what these Civil War buttons were. So there was a note and it had two sides. So I've got that in the pictures there on the side. But these buttons were from the uniform of Joseph C. Truesdale who served in the Civil War with General Sherman. He was the father of Earl C. Truesdale, a longtime resident of Barocco, Wisconsin who in turn was the father of Genevieve E. Truesdale Paulson. And then on the other side, in, I don't know whose handwriting, but one of, you know, it's either my grandmother's or her mother, um, but it talks about how it was from her mother's side of the family, um, Madeline Frazier Ewers. Uh, and, and it's just really interesting. So I have some of that perspective, but here's what I don't know. And this is where I would, what I would encourage people to do journaling or something else because I don't know who Joseph C. Truesdale was, right? So I have this really interesting artifact from our history, but I, I find myself craving some sort of, who was he? What was he like? But very interesting that he was with General Sherman and maybe I can go find it out. I'm doing this stuff on ancestry.com. It's really cool, but it takes work to get to that point. Whereas if we all start now that we're in a digital world, we can create our story and we can kind of share that. This is who Brian Sherwood is. This is who yeah. his mother is. And, and from their perspective, rather than someone else's outside perspective. And then the last one, and I don't know if my mom is still on, but if she is, I'm sorry. Um, let's see here. My mom's first dress. And I won't give away the, the how old it is. Um, 23 but, years well, old. It, and I, ha I have her information in there. Sorry, mom. But... <laughs> uh, but at any rate, it, it, she had written this little note in there and it says Evie's first dress and it used to be pink, you know, and, and I love that. It, it's this little thing that, you know, we, we have, um, our kids were christened in a, uh, a gown that my wife's family has had in the family for 105 years. And every single grandchild has been christened in that gown. Um, and, and it's really kind of neat, right? So there's a lot of history, there's a lot of stuff, but that story's got to kind of track. And what we really should be doing is documenting who has been christened in this gown. And so the more we can add to these stories, the more of that value that we can kind of provide. Um, let me just double check, make sure there aren't any other questions. It doesn't look like there are. Um, but I, again, I just want to really thank you for your time. I know you're off to go do some stuff for, for work right now. And I appreciate you taking time out of your day and doing this. Pleasure. I will uh, edit this down a little bit and get it up on YouTube. Um, and then however else we can help you guys, you just let us know. But thank you so much for your time, Ryan. And, and, and God bless you. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone who joined us as well. I really appreciate it, Brian. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye now, everyone.